good day, Facebook. As usual, it's a pleasure to uh, be in your company once again, and again to do a brief teaching on the uh, dreams that indicate the spirit of poverty uh, attached to our lives. <clears throat> this is going to be a very, very provocative teaching in that a lot of times when we experience uh, financial adversity, financial financial tsunamis, I call them. A lot of times, we just look at what's physically around us and try to attribute those financial dilemmas to uh, a lending institution that we can't afford to pay, or having lack of resources, or, or things of that nature. And in our minds, we're convinced that you know, if we were to uh, get a second job, uh, uh, if someone was to bless us with some money, or we would even find some money, we can uh, satisfy a lot of the debt that we would have debt that we would have incurred. Very rarely, we look at these things from a spiritual perspective, and, and as you would have known already in following my teachings, I am convinced that there's no human in this planet that could convince me otherwise that the origin of everything that takes place or transpires in our lives are happening from an original place, which I call, which the Bible referred to uh, as the spirit world. So today our teaching is on recognizing dreams that are revealing to us the spirit of poverty being attached to our lives that has become unknown to you the source as to why you cannot achieve or go past a certain point uh, financially uh, in your life. Now before we get into that, I just want to wish everybody a happy, sorry, a Merry Christmas. I'm sure you've had a, a wonderful time with your family and friends. I sure did. I had a wonderful time with my wife and my family. And uh, it was a beautiful day yesterday. Today here in the Bahamas, uh, and, and this is why I love the Bahamas, we are celebrating our holidays on the weekday, which is Monday and Tuesday, Christmas and Boxing Day. Yes, we recognize Christmas and Boxing Day on the weekend, but you know what? Our government has decided that we would uh, have the work weekday to extend that, that vacation. Now, let's get right into it. When we're dealing with a, a, a spirit, clearly we're dealing with an entity that we cannot see, we cannot touch, we cannot physically interact with. The reason why this is important at the beginning of this teaching is because this teaching is geared to showing you that the source, the genesis, or the beginning of the financial crisis in your life has very little to do with what you deem as the source as not having enough money or having enough resources to satisfy those things in your life that requires money to satisfy. What we're going to do today is we're going to go deeper to ascertain or to discover the root as to why, why is it that we find ourselves in the same cycle year after year, month after month, holiday, Christmas, New Year's, whatever, after holiday, where we're coming up short, or there's not enough, or just enough, or barely making it, or not having anything at all to facilitate the things we would like to do that requires finances to do it. So in looking at it from a spiritual perspective, we have to now go to the scriptures. Why? Because these scriptures are spiritual laws that are going to give us the root causes as to why these things are happening to us. All right? The first scripture I've been uh, mentioning, mentioning this scripture for a number, in a number of my videos. And the first scripture that I want us to go to is Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 3 to verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 3 to verse 4. What we're seeking in this particular passage of Scripture is an origin. 
That's what we're looking for. See, because once we find the root of something, then destroying whatever that something is becomes much more easier. Because once the root of anything has been uh, uh, pulled up or destroyed or whatever, then whatever that was cannot exist anymore. It cannot uh, grow or reproduce anymore. Like I've said in my previous videos, our problems became repetitive or begin to cycle itself simply because the solutions that we were given only dealt with the branch, only dealt with the leaves or the trunk or the uh, fruit of the tree. And you know as well as I do that even when these things have been removed, then they regrow or they reproduce. So in this teaching today, we're going after the root, all right? So in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 3. I'm going to take our time and read this because we want understanding. We're going to read from verse 3 to verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 1. And here's what it says. It says, bless, this is verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us, past tense, this already happened. Who has blessed us, listen carefully, with all spiritual, circle that word, powerful, circle the word spiritual. Read it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have, already, this already happened, had blessed us with not some, not a piece, and not a portion. God through his son Jesus Christ has already you know you hear all the time God getting ready to do this and God getting ready to do that no 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 forget that God has already this is a past tense sentence this has already happened God has already blessed us look at the word B L E S S E D any word with the letters E D and its ending is speaking to an event that has already transpired, already taken place. See, I love to break down the scriptures because, see, for me, I need understanding. Before I jump to the next scripture, I need to know who he's talking to, why is he saying this, what is the significance to do with anything in my life? So the scripture is making it clear. That God has already, God ain't getting ready to bless you. There isn't a blessing up the road for you. To, no, God has, you have already been blessed. Period. But not only that, according to the scripture, it says that he has already blessed you with all. Not some, all, not peace, all, not a portion, all. He has already blessed you with all spiritual blessings. It's powerful. Spiritual blessings. Why? Because the word spiritual speaks of an original state, an origin. So I was telling you like on the last video. Your blessings in its nature, in its origin, in its genesis, in its beginning is spiritual. You cannot touch them. You cannot touch the future wife, the future husband now. You, you, probably, you cannot see them now. You cannot see that future promotion or the, the wealth that God has. All of that exists. But the same scripture is going to now tell you the geographical location of this invisible blessing. And watch, let's, let's continue reading it. And let's start from the beginning again. Blessed be the God... And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings. Where are they? In heavenly places in Christ. That term heavenly places speaks of the spirit realm, the spirit world in Christ. So what is the scripture telling us now? The scripture is saying that from the day you enter this world, God has put everything to cause you to advance, to go forward, to go to the next level of your, 
everything you have been equipped with in its origin spiritually, which are the blessings, to advance you. But these blessings don't just drop on you all at one time. The Bible says that they are in heavenly places or spiritual places, or the spiritual realm, sorry, in Christ Jesus. So all throughout the course of your life, let's say you were born like myself in 1970. And let's say I live to see uh, 2070, okay? God has littered throughout the tenure of my life all blessings for me to go forward, all blessings for me to advance, all blessings for me to be the head and not the tail, all blessings to continually progress in life. Therefore, it is these blessings, you got to hear this, that when the enemy comes at you, this is what he is challenging. He isn't challenging the physical car that's here already. He isn't challenging the wife that's giving you trouble or the husband that's giving you trouble already. No, 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 no. He deals with you from the origin, from the spiritual realm. Let me deal with the spiritual blessing, which was the wife, which was the husband, which was the promotion. Because once I shut them down spiritually, ain't nothing happening for them physically. Because that is the law of manifestation. That is the law of the spiritual realm. Whatever has been dealt with in that arena, the invisible world, the spiritual world, it directly affects us here in our natural world. I don't care how much Bible school you've been to. I don't care how much theological, whatever degrees you have. If you have not mastered that concept, then you will spend the rest of your life with titles, bishop, apostle, and all of this and have zero effect or power in the earth realm. You know why? Because your entire fight is in violation of Ephesians 6 and 12 where you don't understand the spiritual realm and understand you deal with spiritual entities. But instead, you wage your war against people, against things, against environment, against things, that are, against things that are physical. So the scripture is saying, listen, listen carefully. God has already blessed you. On everything that you're praying for, you already have in its raw state, which is the, 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 the spiritual world, the blessings. And what you need to do is start coming in agreement with what God has already put in place for you. He desires for you to have a husband or wife. He desires for you to excel. He desires for you to have a good health. The Bible is littered with these promises. You now need to come. Father, I thank you for blessing me in advance for my mate. I thank you that you have already blessed me past tense for this promotion. I thank you and come in agreement with what you have already done in advance to remove the sickness from my body. I bless you for what you have already done in advance for making my family sorted out and to remove the spirit of division. So this scripture is saying to you that those things you've been begging for, those things you've been crying for, that God has already allotted at specific points in your life has already been set. The question is, what has been delaying them? What has been challenging them? What has been fighting us from that arena that has caused those divine appointments to never manifest themselves? That is what we're going to get in. So, in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 1, which is the next verse that we're going to go to, because the first verse, verse is basically pointing out to us that this awesome God that we so talk about has already, this has already happened, man. Trust me, this, according to this, it has already happened. And he says now, not only have I blessed you with, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places or in the spiritual realm, he says that, watch verse four now, watch this verse four. He says, according as he, which is Jesus, which is God, has chosen us in him, watch this now, before, before, for the foundation of the world. I love that. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, what is this basically saying? 
He says, remember what I told you in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, that I have already, past tense, blessed you with all spiritual blessings. And really what it means, all blessings are for you to go forward. He says, and they are in him. He says, now before the foundation of the world, before I set up the structure, the foundation to rest the world upon, he says, I have sorted out all of what you should be blessed with as it relates to your life. Before I did all of that. So, what does that mean? That means a lot of the things that you're crying about right now and, and, and going to God about and weeping, you're crying for stuff that you already have, that you already own. But because of your lack of knowledge, because of the limited education of the scriptures that you have, then you follow that same old church trend, the same old church talk. Everywhere you go, God getting ready to do. God getting ready to do that. God getting, oh, I see God doing this, and I see God doing that. But nobody's saying to you, who I see, oh, I come in an agreement with what God has already released for you. I come in an agreement. I see a blessing that was supposed to happen years ago, but the devil blocked it. But I come in agreement with you, my brother, that that spirit that has tied up that blessing that God had already released to you is released in the name of Jesus. No, nobody don't pray like that because they don't understand Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 where God has already, past tense, released it to you. It's gone. So, I don't want to stray away from my topic. I'm just trying to build this foundation. Now that we understand that we already bless financially, we are already blessed health-wise. We are already blessed in every area of our life because the blessing is the raw material for advancement in the earth for the human being. As well as the curses are the, real, uh, sorry, are the raw material for stagnation in the life of a person. So when you hear the term uh, curses or curse, it means that it is the invisible raw material that when released into the life of a human being, it stagnates. It, 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 it anchors them to a place of non-progress. So the blessing and the curses are spiritual raw materials that are activated through the course of our lives by others or ourselves to be released into our lives. So I'm sure we get that understanding. Now, the next scripture I want you to go to is... Matthew chapter 13 and verse 25. And this is a spiritual law. And this is going to tie directly into what I've said so far. How is it that this devil, who is in no way can be compared to the power of the Almighty God, how is this fellow able to stop the power or the releasing of the blessings of God for our lives. Is there a law? Is there something that he has tapped into that has given him this right? Yes, he has. And you see, this is why you need to know the laws of God. When you don't know the laws of God, you have volunteered to be a co-conspirator with your adversary, the devil, to oppress you. Hey, devil, can you help me oppress me today? That's basically what you say. So, in Matthew chapter 13, let's read verse 25. I love this. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 25. And this is a spiritual law as it relates to how Satan and his agents tie up the blessings that are in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus prevented from happening. The scripture says in Matthew 13 verse 25, spiritual law as it relates to our dreams, but while men slept, you hear that? But while men slept, his enemy, hello, came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. Now you've read that for years and you just figured some parable or Jesus making another statement. No, no, this is the laws of God. These are the laws that govern the invisible realm and our physical realm. And the scripture is saying that our enemy, Satan and his demonic host, 
through this law, while we are asleep at night, because remember I told you, 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 you are a, 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 a spirit housed in a physical fleshly body. And when this physical part of you rests and go to sleep, you become unconscious of the events around you, your spirit man is awake, interacting with the realm of the spirit. So the scripture is saying here that the enemy now takes advantage at this very vulnerable point in our lives while we are asleep. And now he begins to come in the realm of the spirit at your spirit. And all of the blessings pending for that particular time, he now begins to sow bad seeds. How does he do this, Kevin? When you find yourself drinking in the dream, eating in the dream, having sex in the dream. All these crazy things are symbolic of curses or tears, like the scripture said, among the wheat, which is our blessings. And the Bible says, after he would have done that, he goes his way. Why? Because he know what he has now reprogrammed your life for to give him a specific end result. And that can only happen if you are ignorant to the laws of God. That's the only way it can happen. So I'm taking this time out to show you, you cannot go into next year, 2017, under the same ignorance, under the same nonsense that is being exposed to you. Oh, God getting ready to bless you. Turn around seven times. Give your neighbor a high five. How much high fives you can give this person, man? How much time you can spin around? How much time you can somersault? Do all this garbage only to come up with the same end result. The church people is the first set of people I see say every day, oh, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting an end result. But that's what you're doing. That is exactly what you're doing. Show them the word of God. Show them the scriptures that, that, that literally break the, 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 the chains and the shackles in the realm of the spirit. And watch things now begin to, to ch I speak from experience. Everything I teach on, I have lived it. I have seen it happen in my life initially and in the lives of others when I tell them about it and they follow not Kevin law but the laws of the scriptures so the scriptures say in here man this fella this spirit entity along with his cohorts came in your sleep and begin to reprogram your life for failure and you woke up having zero knowledge of this and as a result of it, the end result, he don't have to rush you no more. He now sit back and he watch the results of failure, of stagnation, of disappointment. And you crying out know, because of your ignorance. Father, why is this happening to me? I've fasted. I've called Kevin. We've prayed. We've done this. <coughs> Excuse me. I called the Pope. Pastor, pastor say, just wait on you, God. Pastor say, God can turn it around. God can fix it. And he been telling me this from 1972. Nothing is happening for me. Nothing. Because that is not God's way. God's way is for you to deal with these matters from the unseen realm, from the spirit world. Okay? So we've gotten two laws so far. The first one we found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, which clearly dictates that God has already blessed us. This ain't something we try to do. This has already happened. And all the blessings is, is the raw material of the things that he had planned for our lives. A good marriage, a good job, our own business, whatever the case may be. College education, your children prospering. All of that is in the blessing. A blessing in a simplest term is for you, for, for, for a spiritual endowment on you to cause you to catapult and do things you couldn't do under normal circumstances. A curse is just the opposite. A curse is a spiritual endowment that has come upon you for a legal reason in both cases and that has now given those entities the right to stagnate your progress, stagnate your growth. Because the whole idea for man and his original reason for being on the earth outside of worshipping his God is to advance in life. Any area of your life you're not advancing, any area of your life you're stagnated, you're under a curse. You may not like that term, but it doesn't matter because the Bible speaks of that clearly. You were made to advance. You were made to go forward. You were made to propel throughout life. Now, in our topic today, we're going at dreams that indicate poverty. And it was imperative that I give you those two laws so that you would understand the principle on the things that I'm saying to you. So when you see these particular things that I'm about to call off right now, 
in your dreams, then make no mistake, there is a spirit of poverty attached to your life. Now, what does that mean? When a spirit of poverty, remember, we're talking about a spirit. This is an invisible entity that is in your life or part of your life. And he is responsible that you do not advance in anything financially. Any bonus, any miracle money, anything to do with finances to enhance you or to better the quality of your life. This chief spirit is responsible with lesser spirits to block every area that uh, resources, especially financial resources, can come in. So, one of the first signs of the spirit of poverty in your dreams is where you have dreams that are filled with, with roaches and, and rats, mice, all of this speaks of poverty. Or you have dreams where you're always in tattered clothes, old clothes, raggedy clothes, you're always looking like a bum or shoes with, with holes in it, or you see yourself in a dream begging for money, or, or begging for food, or, or picking up coins, that beggar position. All of this is revealing a, a, a spirit. Or let's say you had a dream, and in your dream, you lost your wallet, or you lost your purse, or whatever container that you use to keep funds in, again, this is showing a spirit of poverty. And, and let me give you another law to support these things or before we go into the other uh, things we can look for. In uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, it says that the enemy only shows up in our life to kill, to steal, circular word, and to destroy. So again, when you see these three labels being displayed throughout the course of your life, A, know that it is the enemy, B, he's coming with your cooperation. See, because you have to, which I'm going to explain to you later, you have to agree with what he's doing. You know, Once you agree with what he's doing, then the deal has been sealed to now uh, uh, carry out this particular curse in your life. So, you had a dream where your wallet or your purse was stolen. That speaks or, or, or indicate a, a spirit of poverty. Wearing raggedy clothes, I told you that. Uh, begging for money, uh, begging for food, etc. Uh, the loss of cash. You've had a dream where you know you had X amount of money in your pocket or you had X amount of money put somewhere and all of a sudden when you went back there, you cannot find it. The spirit of poverty. Another point I want to lay out to you too. Whenever you're having dreams and you see things moving in that dream or something going missing or something happened but you didn't see no hands or human do it, that is pointing to a spirit. There's a spirit that's called, so the dream is showing you that what is happening here is not natural. There are uh, invisible entities that's orchestrating what you're seeing in this dream. So your cash going missing. Let's say you had a dream and you took out your wallet. I mean, you opened the wallet because you knew you had money in it, but there's no money. You didn't see nobody steal this money. You didn't see nobody take this money. Your wife, husband, whatever, didn't take the money. So the dream is revealing that the loss of the funds in this wallet that you did not see anyone steal, there is a spirit robbing you. The next point I want to make. Whatever is being relieved of you financially in that dream, like anything else, then it means that if you don't rebuke the dream while you're in the dream, or you don't rebuke the dream after you have come out of the dream, then expect losses financially in your everyday life. You see, remember what I said, the law. Nothing could happen in this world, our physical world, unless it was achieved or conceived in the unseen world or the spirit world. So whatever you lose in that world, whatever was taken from you, whatever was destroyed, whatever, then you better anticipate and prepare for the losses to manifest physically if you do not challenge, if you do not resist the dream and the contents. By saying, Father, I, re I had a dream where my, my wallet was missing, or I had a dream where I, 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 I lost uh, my bank card, therefore I renounce that evil, subtle agreement or covenant that the enemy was trying to coerce me and buy and, and coming together with him, and it will never happen. It will, I reject it. I renounce. See, this is how you have to come at it. 
Why? The next law, Proverbs 18 and 21. Death in life is where? In the power of your tongue. And they that love it, what is the it? The death or the life that they speak, they say they shall eat the fruit of it. So my words will produce fruit. So what I do now, now that I have this power, I speak to what I saw, what was made privy to me in the dream. Father, first of all, I thank you for revealing to me the spirit. I curse you in the name of Jesus. I bind you according to the power of the living God. I command you to be destroyed and your plans and your intents for me to be broke, busted, and disgusted. I reject it. I renounce it. I curse it. It will never happen. It will never come to pass because I refuse to agree with it in the name of Jesus. Instead, I come in agreement with the blessings of the Lord that has been assigned at this time in my life to be released and unhindered in the name of Jesus. That is how you pray against these things. So going back to our list here now, let's say you had a dream, and in this dream, you were at the bank. But the bank door was closed. You see people inside. In fact, you saw people going inside before you got in. As soon as you got there, someone closed the door and locked it. A spirit of poverty. It's saying to you in the realm of the spirit that this, this spirit is trying to lock away resources for you. So you need to pray against that. Another dream you had, let's say you had a dream and you went to the ATM. And either your card wasn't working when you put it in there. And I had a dream similar to this too. Or you put your card in and just when you push in your numbers and put in the amount, the electricity went off. All of this speaks of not only a uh, a uh, uh, spirit of poverty which is the chief spirit but this specific dream now is revealing a lesser tormenting spirit what does that mean now this tormenting spirit which still is in relationship to the spirit of poverty is a spirit of financial delay you follow me it's meaning now that there's certain things that you are expecting on the horizon and the devil and his cohorts know this so from the spiritual realm they come at you. Remember we said in uh, Matthew 13 and 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears or curses among the wheat or among the blessings and then he went his way. Excuse me. The law now just showed you that's, that's what's happening in the dream. So now you are the ATM and the, you put in your card, punch in your code and punch in the amount you want and the electricity went off and you wake up. Father God, I come against the spirit of financial delay according to that dream and because that dream came to me then it is evident to me that there is a financial blessing on the way and the enemy is trying to block it in the realm of the spirit so i want to stop that and i want to block that now in the mighty name of jesus i renounce his plan i reject his counsel i reject his antics and his tactic and that they will never take place in my life Instead, I come in agreement with your word that has considered me the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath, and to advance continually based on the blessings for this period in my life. That is how you pray against these things. Another thing we can look at here, uh, like I told you about the, the, the roaches and rats. And years ago, I used to have, I mean, myriad of dreams of roaches. I mean, to the extent of being gross. And I never knew what they meant during that time. But of course, through the length of my study and so on, it was made known to me the spiritual significance. When you think about a place that is riddled with poverty and environment, uh, rodents and roaches are the most common type of uh, creatures that you would find there. Symbolically, symbolically, this represents poverty. Not just poverty, we're talking about a spirit of poverty. How do you know that there's a spirit of poverty and not just your regular, everyday lack in your life in terms of what is normal? A spirit of poverty will always be evident in unexplained financial losses. For example, let's say you make a hundred grand a year. And you're trying to go to the bank for a home that costs 200000 you want a loan. Meaning that you have no other bills and your salaries are coming in, you just pay a regular salary bill such as light water, food, what have you. But you don't have no major loans nowhere else. 
You go to the bank and they say to you, oh man, this, this is going to be easy, man. Listen, getting you signed up for this mortgage, <laughs> this is a piece of cake. Give us a couple of days and then we'll give you back shortly with a confirmation that you're going to get it. Then they call you back and they say, well, Mr. Ewing, I don't know, but based on our records, you know, we can't give you this. What do you mean you can't give me the loan? I make $100,000 a year. I can pay this off in no time. Stuff like that. When it is unexplained, when it doesn't make no sense, you are due for a promotion. You are due for a bonus. Everybody else get a promotion. Everybody else get a bonus. You work the hardest. You did the most. All of a sudden, we, we can't do it. Maybe next time, you know, we, you got the, the numbers and I'm sure next time you'll get it. Next time come again and it cannot happen. But when we go back to our dreams, this, this is the origin. See, what, why are you so upset when these things happen? Because you're trying to deal with something which is really the end result of what has already happened. The enemy defeated you in your dream, which is the spiritual realm. Matthew 13 and 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed curses among the wheat, which is the blessings. You did nothing about it. You didn't rebuke it. You didn't challenge it. You, in fact, you, you silent then gives consent. So by default, you agree to it. So this now gave the invisible entity, which is the spirit of poverty in this case, the right now to now challenge every area of your life that now dictates financial increase or financial blessings for you. The enemy run the show now. So this is why it's important. You must understand these symbols. You must understand the significance of the symbols in the dream. It's not by accident you're having this dream. God in his infinite wisdom who has given everybody the tool of their dreams to now see in the realm of the spirit excerpts of the things pending for their lives or things that are against their lives. You now haven't been made privy to this through life and death, which is in the power of your tongue, can either come in agreement or reject it in the dream or come in agreement or reject it once you've woken up or in the natural. You have the power to do that. But if you sit back and you just want to tell Kevin, boy, Kevin, I had this dream last night. Man, like here, these bunch of roaches come after me. And boy, like here, I take off running. <laughs> so what is that supposed to do? What is running away from the spirit going to do if you didn't cancel the spirit? So these are just a few things to indicate poverty in your life. Now, another thing I want us to look at here, I want you to, because I'm going to give you some scriptures now, and I hope you got a pen, because I want you to write these down. I want to give you now the effects of poverty in your life. What are the effects? And these effects, uh, of course, I give you some of them just now about being rejected from the bank and so on. But one of the chief signs, one of the chief physical signs in your life of the spirit of poverty is where every place as it relates to resources and finances reject you. Follow me? Everywhere you go, some guy, you could hear on the news right now, there's a guy who is giving away $50 billion. And everyone who comes, he's going to give the maximum million. If you are the first one there, he rejects you. Everybody else, they get their money. The spirit of poverty is synonymous with the spirit of rejection. It is designed for everyone that could help you to reject you. And if you don't see it that way, then you will spend the less of your life feeling sorry for yourself or having people pray over you and don't know what they're praying for. Just praying a general prayer. When you're dealing with spiritual warfare, listen, you need to zoom in on the root of the problem and deal with that. Because if you don't do that, then the Spirit is going to use to their advantage. James chapter 4 and 7, which says that we ought to submit ourselves unto God. Meaning, let's do this thing God's way. And it says, if we resist the devil, read it small d, not the big D as in Satan. Devil means as in the devil of poverty, the devil of sickness, the devil of confusion. He says that this, if we resist the devil, in this case poverty, he will flee. So what do you think is going to happen if you don't resist these devils that's being exposed in your dreams? Then he have every legal right to, to stay there. I remember having a conversation with someone uh, in the past. 
and they were telling me about uh, a particular sickness that they had and how the sickness was causing so much financial strain on them. And what they've decided to do was keep praying for healing as it relates to this particular sickness. And immediately the Spirit of the Lord uh, arrested me right there and indicated to me that the spirit of infirmity is just another spirit that came in through the spirit of poverty. And it is the spirit of poverty that is causing these events to happen in their life to cause their financial uh, areas to be drained. So I said to the person, I said, you know what? Forget the spirit of poverty. I say, sorry, the spirit of infirmity. I said, from today forward, go on a fast, go on a three-day fast. I normally require a three, or request a three-day fast. The number three speaks of completion and perfection. I said now, and, and I gave them all of the scriptures as it relates to prosperity and so on and what God wants for you in terms of his goodwill in the earth. And I said, now, when you pray for the next three days, don't touch no food. You want to drink water or whatever, but no food. And you're going to focus. No TV, no food, no cell phones, no nothing. Cut all that out. Cut that out. Set the time aside. And what you're going to do now, through prayer and fasting, and with the scriptures of God, which are the laws of God, it's like you come into the courtroom with your case, and these are the laws to support your case. And you're now making your case and your petition to God who's the supreme judge. And now as you begin to levy these laws that God has put in place, then you will begin to break that spirit and watch things change for you. Well, guess what? Guess what happened to them? After going through that process that I told them, within a matter of days, all that, whatever they was going through, came to an abrupt end. And in fact, they had just started whatever pills the doctors had given. It came to an abrupt end. So what does that mean? No more money for the doctors. No more money for medication. No more money for the hospital. That end right there. Every other area where they were hemorrhaging financially came to the abrupt end. Why? Is it because of Kevin's super duper powers? No. Did Kevin cast a spell? No. What Kevin did was advise them to follow the laws of God. Did, tell them, did Kevin tell them go down by the beach and bathe naked at 12 o'clock in the night? No. Did tell Kevin tell them drink a concoction to a four-way crossing? No. Did Kevin tell them put garlic on them and spin around seven times and somersault? No. Kevin gave them the laws of God that supersedes any other law in the universe. That's what Kevin did. So no credit to Kevin. We thank God that Kevin interrupted their plan by the power of God to give them that instruction. But it was up to them to follow the rules of the word of God. It's as simple as that. So this is why I become irate and a lot of people attack me on this. When I go to these services and so on and I hear about a special offering of a thousand dollars and God is going to do this if you give six trillion dollars. Where's the scripture? Where's this? Where's this law? I've never read it. So this is what I never ever Reject or saying you should not give to a ministry. You should give to a ministry, in my opinion, as much as you could. Because they're dealing with the core of humanity's problem if that institution is doing it God's way that is. So, yes, I agree to that. Yes, uh, they want to put on a new wing for the children's church. They want to do more uh, outreach ministries. Yes, give. In fact, give more than $1,000 in those cases. But don't tell Kevin, who know the law, that if that God does something special when you sow a thousand dollars, you are a liar. And the devil is in you using you to manipulate the people of God. And I, and I don't care who have a problem with that. If you want to refute that with me, then you give me the scripture that shows the thousand dollar seed making a special difference in someone's life. Other than that, shut up, I don't want to hear you. Back to the floor. So now, rejection is synonymous with the spirit of poverty. That when the spirit of you is on you, its tentacles begin to influence others' decision and views of you. To the extent they reject you for no reason. They might have liked you before, but they can't stand you now. You could go into a bank or something, and the, the, the teller giving you attitude for your own money. 
The teller trying to make it difficult for you. The loan officer trying to give you every hop, skip, and jump to get to a particular position where everybody just sailed through. So the spirit of rejection is synonymous with poverty. Now, let us look at a few scriptures. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 15. And I'm going to read it here because I want to give you clear-cut evidence of this spirit and when its tentacles uh, spread out, these are the things that you could expect to happen. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 5. Am I getting this? 15, sorry. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 15. Listen what it says. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 15 says, The rich man's wealth is his strong city, or this is his confidence. The second part of the scripture says, the destruction of the poor is their poverty. Now, let it sink in a little bit, because we can explain that. The destruction, the, what is destroying the poor man is his ability Sorry, is it, his, is, it, is it his position of being poor? No. No. The word poor means to be lacking in a particular area. Of course, the most common understanding of being poor of someone not having their basic necessities to exist. But I want you to read the scripture and, and get an understanding. Part B of Proverbs uh, 10 verses 15 clearly dictates that the destruction. What is destroying the poor man? Is it him being poor? No. The scripture is showing you there's a spirit of poverty. Listen. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. What the scripture is saying, there is a spirit of poverty on this person that's destroying their lives and causing them not to go forward. Spirit. I know plenty of people who are poor in certain areas. They're not being destroyed. They're not being publicly rejected and humiliated. Many of them I know. But the scripture, if you see the scripture from a spiritual perspective, it is saying, it is telling you what is destroying this man, this poor person. What is destroying him? A spirit. Now let me break it down some more for you so it'll give you a better clarity of what I'm talking about. Okay, let's say, I try to find a good example to use. Think about a person you know right now that lacking. When I say lacking, they're not wearing tattered clothes and they look broken, look like a bum. They just aren't where they used to be financially. So that represents lack in that particular area, which also represents poor. Remember, the word, if you look up the definition of the word poor, it means to be lacking or not having sufficient in a certain area. Now, those people are still able to dress nicely, uh, take care of themselves. Again, they may be kind of back on the rent or back on the mortgage a little bit, but they, they don't look the part. They still got themselves looking good. So they're not being destroyed. This scripture is saying that the poor, Jesus, you've got to read that again. It's saying that his destruction is as a result of poverty. The spirit of poverty on him is causing people who could help him to resist him, to reject him, to cause him not to have in life. So the root of his problem isn't the fact that he is poor, because all of us are poor. We are lacking some area of our life. The root of his problem is that there is a spirit that will normally, that, that, that favor and other spirits of God will come and help him to resist that. So there's a, a man of God may even come into the city to bless him. But if that man of God isn't a strong man of God, that spirit and the tentacle of the spirit of poverty can make him resist the poison he was originally sending to help. So this is why in my teaching, I'm trying to get you to look at the root. And the root isn't the fact that you don't have money. The root isn't the fact that you don't have a car. The root isn't the fact that you don't have education. The root of your problem is that 
There are spiritual components in place that's blocking the original blessing that God had already secured for you before the foundation of the world. That is being challenged. That is being opposed. That is being resist. And it's being opposed, challenged, and resist by the spirit of poverty. This is important to note because now you pray against a specific spirit. You know what you was praying before? Oh Lord, send the money. Lord, send the child school fee. Lord, if you could only send it this go round, Father. But I just want to pay off this semester for my college, Lord. Oh Lord, send me a job. I can, I'll work to Burger King just to make the difference. You, you, listen to you. That spirit on you even got you talking with a poverty mindset. No. Deal with the spirit. From today forward, you deal with the spirit of poverty. Father, if they have projected the spirit of poverty against my life by the means of witchcraft, or the spirit of poverty has entered my life through generational curses, or there are certain things that I've been confessing that invited the spirit of poverty, this day I break the covenants, this day I reject every affiliations with these spirits, and that they will no longer be working along with me ignorantly for my own demise. No more. Today's the end of it. I break that covenant. I break that curse. I break that known or unknown agreement that I've made either in the spiritual realm in my dream or confess verbally daily with my mouth. How do I confess daily with my mouth, Kevin? Poverty. Who does that? Nobody does it. Yes, you do. You know how you do it? Child, guess what? Every time you make one dollar, you got to spend two. Jesus, every time you put one foot forward, you got to take two backwards. My God. He's just paying, working to pay bills. You are invited. You are coming in agreement with the evil voices of the satanic realm that's projecting those thoughts to you that you're speaking and coming in agreement with and now putting yourself in shackles in the realm of the spirit again. Break the covenant. Break the covenant. So in Proverbs 10 and 15, it says clearly that the destruction of the poor is not that he don't have the right resources. It says poverty, the spirit of poverty is the source of his, him being destroyed, of him not getting uh, or, or being advanced. That is his problem. Now let's look at another scripture. Let's look at Proverbs, excuse me, chapter 14 and verse 20. And I hope you have your Bible. I hope you're writing down these scriptures for you to go back and, and, and reference. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 20. And listen to what it says. It says, the poor is hated even of his own neighbors. Jesus, they can't stand him. But they ain't doing it because they won't hate him. There's a spirit on them that's being emitted from the poor man to resist him, to reject him, to despise him, to have nothing to do with him. It's a spirit. Read it again. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 20. It says the poor is hated even of his neighbor. Watch this now. But the rich have many friends. Blessing. Mm -hmm. So poverty, like I've been telling you, is synonymous. The spirit of poverty, sorry, is synonymous with the spirit of rejection. It's synonymous. It, it works hand in hand together. Because poverty figured out, the spirit of poverty, poverty that is, has figured out that, you know what? Yes, he have a, a, a bank account with this. Yes, he have uncles and aunts and cousins and friends who could help him financially. Yes, there are ways and connections that he have to, could, could access resources and to restore him. So what are we going to do, the spirit of poverty talking now, let's challenge those resources. Let's shut him down originally in the realm of the spirit. By influencing any human being, any place, any environment that can uh, remotely assist him financially. Let's shut that down and it will never happen for him. He can, he can do all he want to do. Unless he's dealing with the laws of God against us, ain't nothing happening. So Proverbs chapter 14 verse 20 says, The poor is hated, he's rejected, he's despised, even by his own neighbor. You know what I mean? Even if his neighbor poor, even if his neighbor is in the same position as him, he's still rejecting him and he had no better position than him. Is it not a spirit? Is it not a spirit? <laughs> Let's look at another one. Proverbs chapter 19. Hope you're writing this down. Proverbs chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse 4. 
Proverbs chapter 19, verse 4. And, and listen to what it says. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 4 says, Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. My God, how much whooping this man can take? <laughs> the poor is separated. The, 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 the spirit pulls them apart. To make sure that no one could assist him. To make sure that even his poor neighbor, who might be in the same position as him, will not share his resources with him. So you see, I'm making my point that the, the spirit of poverty on a person's life is, sim- is, is synonymous with a spirit of rejection. Let's look at another scripture. Let's look at the same Proverbs chapter 19. And we're going to read verse 6. To verse 7. Listen to what it says. Verse 6 of Proverbs chapter 19. And we can go straight into verse 7. Here's what it says. It says, Many will entreat the favor of the prince. And every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. It's a blessed man. Because if he can be given gifts, he's clearly blessed. And the Bible says, Everybody want to be his friend. But let's drop down to verse 7. It says, All the brethren of the poor. Now forget his neighbors, because we don't see his neighbors and reject him. But there's another group who can reject him now because the spirit of poverty is on his life. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 6 says, All the brethren of the poor do hate him. What has he done? What did he do to you? He broke, busted, disgusted. He couldn't have done nothing to you. He don't have the resources to do nothing to you with. But the spirit on him is influencing the spirit of his brethren to despise him. To hate him, to reject him, to resist him. And if they are all ignorant to these laws that I'm reading to you, they feel comfortable. They don't see nothing wrong with what they're doing. Poverty, the spirit of poverty, is synonymous with the spirit of rejection. So verse 7 of Proverbs 19 says, All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? The scripture says, He pursued them with words, and they are, they are wanting to him. He wanted them down, Lord, help me, please. Why you hate me? And they run it. We don't want nothing to do with you, you broke. <laughs> it's a spirit. Deal with the spirit. If you are not dealing with the spirit, if your leaders or pastors, your apostles are not dealing with the spirit of poverty in their assignments in an attempt to break the curse of poverty on your life, then whatever they are doing, you are wasting your time. Come against the spirit of poverty. Now, what are some of the causes? Now, I'm going to I'm not going to read these scriptures out to you. I'm just going to give you these scriptures. Laziness. Laziness is one of the primary reasons as an invitation to the spirit of poverty. And you will find it in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to give you the scripture. And I'm going to give you the heading. Another sign is dismissing wise counsel or dismissing wise counsel, sorry, wise uh, advice or, or scriptures being given to you to combat these forces. You'll find that in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 18. Another, another cause or sign is, is having an anxious spirit. You, you don't want to think things over or, or seek counsel to make the best decision. You know it all. You just will rush into stuff. Not knowing that this is a spirit on you causing you to do that to secure losses in the end. And you'll find it in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 15. This one I love. I have a friend of mine. He thinks he's a lover boy, right? But whenever we talk, he always says to me, man, Kevin, man, listen, things are really rough. And I said to him on many occasions, the same scripture, Proverbs 21 and 17. In fact, he gets mad with me when I tell him this. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 17 says, I love this. It says, he that loves pleasure shall be poor. Why am I telling you these things? What? They are laws. And when you begin to operate in them knowingly or unknowingly, it's going to set off a, 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 a sequence of events because the spirit of poverty have a right to do it. 
So if you want to play lover boy, you will have sex with all these people and make up all these children and, and go there partying every night and so on and living the high life because you're trying to satisfy your pleasure, the scripture says the end of all of that will pan out for you poverty. Why? Because when you begin to participate in this law, then you invite the spirit of poverty. So poverty is there. He didn't have a reason to come into your life. Ain't nobody doing no obey on you. You ain't speaking nothing as poverty. You ain't going to ingest generational curses of poverty. But all you like to go there and live the high life and you love pleasure, sex and drinking and frolicking and all this stuff, then you get the attention of the spirit of poverty. So according to uh, Proverbs 21 verse 17, it says, He that loveth pleasure, not might, but shall be poor. It's a law, it's a decree. And when you begin to participate like that, then expect poverty as your end result. So I tell my friend, I say, listen, as long as you stay on this route and you think you're the big baller, then expect not to have anything. Expect not to succeed. Expect to always be in a state of lack. Because what you're doing by activating this law is saying, hey, hey poverty, spirit of poverty, sit me here, come here. Listen, I, I need to stay broke, man. And it seems like you be you seem to be the chief on that. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna activate this law that says that if I and I love pleasure. I love pleasure, man. I love the girls, I love the guys, whoever it is you like. I love partying, I like fancy cars, I like expensive stuff, I like Louis Vuittons, I like that stuff. Even though I got all these other girls that pay, forget that man. So so guide me on how to keep me broke. And that's basically what you're saying. So when you activate Proverbs 21 and 17, then your end result is you will be uh, subdued by the spirit of poverty and never able to uh, access the resources that you have or to, to, to distribute them wisely. Uh, worthless pursuits. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 19. Worthless pursuits meaning that you're, you're going after things that are fruitless. That you already know ain't nothing coming out of this. Why are you wasting your time here? A lot of us have found ourselves in those positions in earlier part of our lives. Unfortunately, there are people who 40, 50, 60 still so going through it. Where you're pursuing people that you're infatuated with or you love. And this is not the person you're supposed to be with. So you find yourself buying this. Paying for a trip here. Buying them a car here. Building a house for them. Doing all this stuff. But according to Proverbs chapter 20 verse 19... It says that this worthless pursuit, of course, which is engineered by the spirit of poverty, will cause you to not have in the end. You will not have the resources based on investing them in these fruitless dead-end investments. You wouldn't have what you need to accommodate the things that you'd want to do in your life. All right? The last one I'm going to give you here is Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 22. And it speaks about a person who is stingy, mean, cheap. Huh? They wouldn't give you what they don't want then all of this are invitations to the spirit of poverty uh, uh, in your life. Now, what I'm going to go to now is how do we break the spirit of poverty? Are there scriptures that we can use to destroy the spirit? Yes, yes, there are scriptures. And this is what I really, really want to jump on. And I'm going to be ending in probably the next 10, 15 minutes. Now, in breaking the spirit of poverty... You just don't say, I break you, spirit of poverty. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Spirits adhere to or respond to spiritual laws. If what you're doing or if what you're saying is not uh, aided by a spiritual law, then it's equivalent to speaking... English to a person who only understands Dutch. They're going to be looking at you like, what? So therefore, you, when you're deep, you got to make sure and put in the, the, the semantic of your understanding, you're dealing with a spirit. So just like how I'm looking in this camera and talking to all of you out there, or just like how you would talk to your husband or your wife or your children, you make eye contact. Will you point wherever you want to point and you're speaking to the realm of the spirit and now you're going to quote the word of God. But to add to that, 
in most cases, there are certain things you have to do to now release the spirit of poverty, sorry, of prosperity in your life to subdue and to destroy the spirit of poverty. All right? So, the first scripture I'm going to give you, and uh, I want us to turn there because I want to read it. Excuse me. And that's uh, Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 24 to verse 25. All right? And we want to read to understand, man. You know, going are the days where we just read to say we read a scripture, and then some guy go off screaming and hollering and carrying on or some female, and, and, and you don't know what they were talking about. So I, I love to break the scriptures down. I like to get those keywords, exploit them. So we have a keen understanding what they mean because it is those words that are seemingly insignificant, which becomes the adhesive to all the other parts in the scripture. So you'll find me doing that a lot, where I would zoom in on one particular word and, and get the full uh, understanding or the etymology of the word, which means the origin, where the word came from. And how does it place here? And why is it placed here? Because this is how revelation comes about. Revelation, which is a secret or a mystery that was once covered. So revelation means that now the cover is going to be peeled off, which also means that the, the solution or that revelation always existed. It was just never uncovered, thus giving us the revelation. So in the scripture in Proverbs chapter 11, because now we're talking about how do we annihilate, how do we break the spirit of poverty. Now listen to what it says. In the King James Version it says, there is that scattered or there is a person who's always giving. There is a, a person who's always sharing or distributing what they have. So that's what it means when it says in Proverbs 11 verse 24 that there is that scattering. Or there is a person that's always giving and yet, watch this now, yet they increase. Now this is why I love about the law. The world system says to you, child, save your money. We're going to put up that money for a rainy day, which I agree. Now save your money now. The more you save, the more you'll have. Or the more you save, the more you'll increase. But that isn't what the spiritual law says. Let's read it again. Proverbs chapter 11 is in, the, in verse 24 is saying that the one who gives a lot will increase more. <laughs> so how do we start, Mr. Ewing, to break the spirit by giving the little that you have? Oh, no, no, Kevin, no, no, see, I don't know what you had to drink, but from what I know, mama tell me, save your money for rainy day. Mama say, put up a little bit here and a little bit there, so you'll have so and so later. Well, well, this, well, mama didn't write this book. And we are looking at things from a, because you want to exchange from its origin, which is the spirit, right? So follow the spiritual law that I've given you. Don't be like, where's that scripture I just had? Don't be like Proverbs 13 and 18, which says when you dismiss wise counsel, then you will end up inviting the spirit of poverty. I am giving you the spiritual laws from this book. The book is saying, Proverbs 11 verse 24, it says the mystery to breaking the spirit of poverty is by sharing with others, by giving to others. Many of you out there, who have had any kind of interaction with me, no, I'm a, I'm a giver of books, PDF books, physical books. I'm sharing my talent, my wisdom, my knowledge. What you didn't know is that I was always following this law right here. And what has happened? Mysteriously, I would say mysteriously, but because I know it's the Spirit of God fulfilling His law, men will give into my bosom. People who cheat me in another area, it was made up for in another area. Why? Because the law of my giving is securing increase for me. No matter what man try to do to me, they can work their witchcraft, they obey, all they're doing is doing it to themselves. Because I have activated a law through my giving. And giving doesn't necessarily and always mean financial. I am giving you right now. I am giving you and sharing of my talent. You may be good at giving advice. You may be have some clothes that you got there that, that someone else could have. Some shoes, some, something. But in order to activate it, you got to release it. 
So the scripture says, remember now, we, we, we're combating the spirit of poverty from a spiritual perspective. So therefore, we need spiritual laws to deal with this. So Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24 says, There is a person or there is that person that give or scatter it or they distribute their resources, but yet they increase. What's the next verse? However, there is also people that withhold on to more than what they need, meaning they ain't sharing with nobody. But watch what, this, what the word says. It says, they shall surely come to poverty. Uh-oh. Child, I ain't letting nobody no money. I ain't trying to get my house. I need my down payment. I don't care who come here. The church got ask of thy kingdom. I don't care. I say, yeah? Well, let's see if you can meet that down payment. First of all, you're not talking with a poverty-stricken mindset. Why you want a down payment? If your God owned the cattle on a thousand hill, why would you want a down payment when the silver and gold belong to him? Why are you quoting these things in church, but whenever you go to your God, God, you, you give me a little bit of water, please, Jesus? Or just, just give me a little napkin. I don't need a whole bunch. No! If you truly believe those things, then you will speak according to the way he wants you to speak. But the Bible is saying to you, your stinginess, your meanness, your inability to share, and you know what it really is, what's causing you to do that? Fear. Mm -hmm. See, fear is governing your behavior. Fear is saying to you, well, if I give Kevin this, or I give the pastor that, or if I give the fellow on the road there who don't have anything, this, then what I can have? Fear. The scripture says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God, the same God who caused you to have those things, did not give you a spirit of fear. Instead, he gave you a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and a spirit of soundness of mind. So why are you entertaining fear? Why can't you believe that this scripture says that if I give, I shall increase? But no, you have such a poverty-stricken mindset that you go along with the second portion of the scripture unknowingly or foolishly. And the scripture says, he that holds on to more than what he needs, meaning that even though he has in excess, he ain't giving it to nobody else because fear is dictating to him that if you give that, then where can come from? Who else can help you? Ain't nobody helping you, so why you will help them? No, God is gonna help you. That's why it seems like such a mystery in the initial stages of the scripture when it says that, he that distributes or he that scatters shall increase. He shall, meaning that man don't have nothing to do with this. God speak to the heart of men to now give into your bosom. They don't even know why they're doing it. You know why? Because you activated the law some time ago. And now things begin to happen to you. I could give you story after story, miracle. I remember telling my old pastor that my life is a life of miracles. I am a walking book. I can write books alone. Forget my teachings. Just on the miracles of God via the application of these scriptures. So if you think by hoarding up stuff, you're going to be more successful, then you got another thing coming. Because what you're basically saying, I'm going to defy the law of God. And I can show God I could do this and go contrary and still succeed. Really? The scripture says there's no counsel against God Almighty. So I don't know where you're coming from with that. The scripture says there is, this is Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24. There is that person that always giving, but yet they increase. And there is that one who is always withholding more than he needs, but it says that he will surely come to poverty. I like verse 25. I love this. Verse 25 of Proverbs 11 says, it says that the liberal, the word liberal means free, the free handed. It says the liberal soul shall be made fat. That word fat means wealthy. They will have an abundance. It says he that is always thinking, they look for the opportunity to invest into somebody else's life because they know what the end result of it is going to pan out. It's going to pan out prosperity for them. But more importantly, it's going to crush the head of poverty, the spirit of poverty. Because the spirit of poverty also, remember I tell you he operates with the rejection? The next thing that operates with him, they are cohesive in their behavior, is the spirit of fear. The minute somebody gives you something and you pour, you say, hold on, let me, hold on, let me, let me put this up. When the spirit of the Lord says, I bless you with that so that you can be a blessing to someone else and at the same time 
crushing the spirit of poverty in your life. But all your life you've been consumed to television, consumed to people talking nonsense, consumed to spewing foolishness all day, that you feel by holding on, Kevin just brought me $20. So I, I know my auntie says she needed five, but I ain't giving us a lower one because I don't know where the next 20 can come from. Then you are securing poverty for yourself. According to the scripture. So the scripture says that the liberal soul, verse 25 of Proverbs 11, shall not might, shall be made fat. Watch what it says next. And he that water or water it or, or help other people or invest in the lives of other people shall one day be watered himself. Every one that I've ever given to in my life. I have blessed people with stuff I didn't have. And I'll explain that later. And I do it. My wife said to me, said, man, you are so generous in the things that you do. I said, honey, look at the law. Look at the law. It took a while to get it because she, she now began to see the things happening for us. I said, look at the law. Forget how it looks. Forget how you feel. Forget on what you have or what you don't have. You want to multiply it, then you begin to give, share. And I don't mean stupidly. Say, Lord, release in me. Who does you want me to give to? I remember doing a teaching years ago. I was talking about uh, 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 abundance and prosperity. And the key of that teaching, I was telling people that whenever you asking God for something, be it a home, a car, a house, whatever it is, there is always mysteriously someone that's going to come in your path requesting something from you. I have seen this happen over and over and over and over. I on, the, on my knees, pining out to God, God, I, I need this particular thing done in my life. I, and all of a sudden, either I get up out of prayer, my phone ring, or I jump in my car, or on the way to work, I get a call, or someone send me an email. Ah, uh, brother Kevin, listen, I hate doing this, man. I really, I really need so and so. But because I know the law, I say, man, I, I, I got this brother calling me. Why? Because the scripture says, he that water it, he that give it, one day someone can give him. One day someone can help him. So God is now putting people in your way. They are not coming in your way by accident. God is putting them in your way to get you to activate the law for the law of prosperity to begin working for you and simultaneously crush the head of poverty. Simple as that. It's as simple as that. I am showing you how to overcome the invisible forces that has been oppressing you all your life. I'm showing you how to overcome the invisible forces that has made a mockery of your family, mockery of your friends, mockery of whomever, all because they did not know or understand the law. So whenever, whatever you're asking God for, excuse me, you, you, you're going through a tough time in your marriage, your partner isn't being faithful, whatever the case may be. This is a good time to sow. But like I say, it don't always have to be love. It could be sowing advice, good advice to somebody else's situation who may be going through the same thing you're going through. It's give, sow, release, distribute. And God says, one day, I'm going to send someone to help you. I'm going to fix this situation. But you need to, God said, I could jump in and do it, but that isn't how my laws are written. I need, I, I give you the law, that when you participate, the truth is you come in an agreement to make it, this covenant work, and now I got to work for you. God says, I'm obligated to work for you when you activate the law. But don't sit back thinking I can feel sorry for you because uh, the, the, this and this happened or they take your house and they... No! He isn't a God of sympathy. He isn't a God of you crocodile tears. And he goes, oh, come on, baby. Don't, oh, don't cry. God will fix it for you. No! He said, do my law. It's simple. Do what my law has asked you to do and then watch me do what you could not do. But you have to activate the law. Am I speaking Spanish? Activate the laws of God by doing what the law says. All right? Now, I want us to jump to another scripture. I said 15 minutes, right? I got like about two more minutes. <laughs> Let's go to Proverbs. This is the last one. The Proverbs chapter 20. I have a whole heap more, but I, I can try to keep it short. Proverbs 28. And, and this next scripture I want to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up right here. <clears throat> All throughout the books of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, you're going to find laws that govern poverty and laws that speak to prosperity. And I can show you 99.5% of the laws that speaks of releasing prosperity and crushing the head of poverty will always be tied to a poor person. 
Now let me let it soak in your head a little bit. Most of the laws that speaks about you breaking the spirit of poverty and releasing the spirit of prosperity will more than 95% of the time have to do with someone poor and you investing into their lives. Well, now, I'm going to close with this. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 8. It says, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 8, it says, he, and what I like about this, before I go to front up, when you hear the scripture use the terms he or whosoever, it's not just speaking to Christians. This is important. What it is saying here is that whoever decides to participate in this biblical principle will reap what it says, whether he's a Christian or not, whether he's a Satanist, a voodoo worker, whether he's an apostle, it doesn't matter. The law is the law. And like I've told you in my previous uh, videos and writings, the laws of God isn't looking for the Christian and the, or the Jew or, or, or the holy and thou person. The law is looking for the practitioner of the law. That's what the law is looking for. The law isn't looking if you're fat or skinny, black or white, uh, straight here or curly here. The, the, the law doesn't have the time for that. The law is looking who? who who's doing it? Who, who's doing the law? Uh, the, the scripture goes on to say how the eyes of the Lord is to and fro in the earth and so he can show himself strong. Who do you think those people would be? Those who are practicing the law. Those who have a keen understanding of when they participate in certain uh, things that the scriptures request, then they sit back in anticipation for the law to run its course. So, in Proverbs chapter 28, this is our last verse, verse 8, it says, He that by usury, U S U R Y, that's how you pronounce it, right? And what that word really means is that a person who you borrowed something from, let's say money, and they charge you these, these humongous interests on it. So the scripture says, He that by usury and unjust gain. So there are people out there who are ripping off people. Okay? Through their businesses or what have you. Then there are people out there, maybe banks or whatever, that are charging people these exorbitant interests on home loans, car loans or whatever, or personal loans. It says, he that through usury and unjust gain increases his substance. So what is God in the stuff? Let him, let him do what he got to do. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a purpose in this. He says, he that by usury and unjust gain increases his substance. But watch what it says next. He, who's the he here? The he is the one through usury and unjust gain who has increased his substance. It says, he shall gather it for him that will what? Pity the poor. What am I saying to you? I'm finished. If you are a giver, continue giving. If you are not a giver, then jump on the bandwagon of giving. Because the Bible says, in your doing that, remember what we just read, because all this tie into one. We have just read in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 24 to verse 25. And it says, he that scattereth, or he that gives, or he that shares, or he that distributes, shall increase. That's a mystery. That don't make no sense. Because the more I give out, the less I will have, from what I know. No, 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 no. The scripture says, in the spiritual realm, the more you give, in the spiritual realm, the more you will have, and the more it will manifest you by strangers, by other people, by people who you have no affiliations with. The scripture then goes on in the same Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24. It says, but he that holds on to more than what he needs and he does not want to share, he does not want to help nobody else. The Bible says what he doesn't know is that he's activating a law that will secure poverty or invite the spirit of poverty in his life. The verse 25 of Proverbs 11 says, it says, the liberal or the giving or the free soul, the one who always loves to help, always loves to give to other people. It says that he shall be made fat. 
But in none of these scriptures is saying who's doing it, meaning that it's from a spiritual order. It says, he shall be made for all, he shall be wealthy. And it says, and the same person who is always giving, who is always helping, who is always sharing of their talent, God says, one day I'm going to send someone to help them. One day I'm going to send someone to water them. One day I'm going to send someone to assist them. One day I'm going to take the wealth from someone and give it to them. Who is this someone he's talking about? Let's come back to Proverbs 28 and verse 8. Proverbs 28 and verse 8 says, He that through unjust gain and, tr- and, and charging people enormous interest on stuff and ripping them off, the Bible says he shall definitely increase his substance. But what he don't know is that he is heaping up all that stuff so that God in this case could transfer his wealth to the one that is always pitying and giving to the poor or those who are less fortunate than him. Why he's doing that, Kevin? Because God realized that he can trust you. You're always giving. You're, always, you're not a hoarder. You're not trying to hoard stuff up. God says, man, I, I see you every day. I see you have a heart for people. You know that these things don't belong to you. You know that you're not going to live here forever. You know that you, if you was a, a, a gazillionaire, you could never spend that money in your lifetime. So what you decided to do is just give it away. Just help other people. And you find out that the more that you give, the more that you get. The more that you give, the more that you get. You've eliminated the spirit of fear that comes along with poverty. You've eliminated the spirit of rejection that comes along with poverty. And you've eliminated the main spirit, which is the spirit of poverty. I hope I am making sense to you. Show me some love of making some sense to you. <laughs> because you need to understand these are laws. And the Lord is trying to speak to you that you should not go into 2007 already slated to repeat the same thing that you went through this year. And the only way that it can change if you take the laws of God and you make it active in your life and now you will begin to see the change. Somebody asked you for something today. Somebody asked you for something yesterday. Somebody probably asked you for something last week and you brushed them off. You said, I ain't got it. You probably even lied to them. What you didn't know is that you was pushing away the solution God had for you to give you what you was asking for. You was anyone, if you go to the gas station, or you go to the ATM, or if you meet a bum in the street and he's asking you for something, the first thing your mind is saying to you, I'm not giving that to him for him to go buy alcohol or to buy drugs. That ain't what the law said. The law did not say, only give to him who don't smoke dope. Only give to him who don't drink liquor. The law didn't say, don't give to that fornicator. The law did not say that. Stop putting sub clauses to the law. The law say, he that giveth. It didn't say to a specific person you should give. He says, once you release, it don't matter what they do with it. It don't matter how they perform. It don't matter. He says, what you have done though is activated the law to bring increase for you, to bring wealth for you, to subdue the spirit of poverty, to sever the tentacles of that spirit of poverty, which is rejection and fear. And now you can go forward in life. And the more you give, the more you can get the more you can advance. Because the spirit of poverty, you have arrested. You've now tied him up in the spirit. Why? Because the spirit of poverty, I can't get Kevin. I can't get Jane. I can't deal with them the way I want to because they're activating a law that's keeping me in bondage. They're activating a law where I cannot infiltrate their lives and keep them hindered. I cannot do it because they're doing what God had asked him to do. I try to send fear to tell them that if you give this, you ain't going to have this later. But they seem to reject that. I tell them to hold on to this, but they seem to reject it. And they're going on the laws of God that if they give, then someone got to give them. Now it's manifesting in their life and the spirit of poverty saying, I, I, I forget them. Let me go to the next person who don't know the law. You know the law. There is no way listening to what you're hearing right now for you to go into 2017 with the same silly mindset of securing poverty and working along with the spirit of poverty to keep you broke. I will feel no sorrow and no remorse for you because it tells me that you don't care about the laws of God and you can do it your way. Well, fine. Don't care. Because the law also says in Proverbs 16 and verse 25, it says that there is a way unto us that seem right. But know for sure it's a guarantee that the end of that way, the Bible says, will lead to death and or destruction. So you can take that route. So I'm finished. This is done. I have two more videos that I'm going to do before the end of the year. 
<clears throat> the next video that I'm going to uh, be teaching on is called Dreams uh, That uh, Is Revealing Things Being Buried in Your Dream. Let's say you saw someone burying your clothes or your underwear or your wallet or whatever. We're going to be doing an extensive teaching on that. What does those dreams represent? Well, just to give you a snip of it, it represents someone's burying your, your identity, burying your, 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 your destiny, sorry. If it's just say you saw someone bearing your passport, someone stole your passport in the dream, but your passport represents your identity. It represents who you are. It gives a brief description to whatever immigration officer or whatever looking at it as to where you're from, your height, and all this other stuff, to make sure this is you. So if you see someone bearing stuff like that or bearing money or whatever, we're going to do an extensive teaching on it and we're going to be saturating this particular teaching next time with the, 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 the scriptures, all right? The scriptures of it. My last teaching for the year is going to be a part two. And the Holy Spirit made it clear to me that we got to come back with this. A part two of breaking the covenants of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm going to be doing that probably on the 30th or the 31st, somewhere around that last video. Because I, I have gotten so much responses from that. So much responses. So my last video is going to be around the 30th or the 31st. Of course, I'll put out an advert on it. And we're dealing with part two of breaking the evil covenants of our ancestors. So let me pray with you before I leave. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this group, for this crowd that you have funneled here to hear your word, not Kevin's word, to hear your law, not Kevin's law. And your word declares, Father God, Lord, uh, that, that, that nothing, as far as you're concerned, as it relates to your people, is happening by accident. Therefore, I come in agreement with every scripture, every verse, every chapter that we have released today. I come in agreement with that word because that chapter, that verse, that word is your covenant to us. And I come in agreement with that, Lord. And now that that will begin to, to now permeate into the lives of the listener, into the lives of the hearer, into the lives of the seers, Lord, that they would now take your word and now make your word applicable with confidence and to see the manifestation of whatever it is that you have promised. I come against the spirit of poverty. I come against the spirit of lack. I come against the spirit of just enough, not enough. I come against all those spirits that have set limitations, that have set uh, restrictions on their spirit in the realm of the spirit. I now, Father God, come after Satan and his evil vault that he has stolen the blessings, in this case, the financial blessings of your people, and I command him according to the word of God that I always use. Proverbs chapter 6. Verses 31, which says that if the thief be found, and boy, we, we discovered him today. And now we unseat that devil, that thief today, and command him to return sevenfold of everything that he has stolen from us and kept in his evil treasury. I command it to be released in the realm of the spirit, and we stand in expectation in the realm of the physical for those things that were once lost to now come back to us. In the name of Jesus Christ. I break that spirit of stinginess. I break that spirit of meanness. I break that spirit of fear and rejection that came along with the chief strong man of the spirit of poverty. I bring confusion to these spirits and I pray that they would turn among themselves and eradicate and to be evicted out of the lives of these people in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I plead the blood of Jesus over the mindsets over these people to break that mentality of poverty, to break the verbal communication of poverty from their mouth. Your word declares that death and life is in the power of the tongue. From this day forward, there will be no more, I'm only working the pay bills. No more, if I put one step forward, I only could have to take two back. Get that garbage out of their head, Father God. Rebuild that evil. Instead, Father God, let them all and let us all become an agreement with the blessings that you've assigned to us. And now, Father God, as of this day, because of this teaching, because of this prayer, let those blessings be retroactive in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let those things that we should have had now come forth to even enjoy and to mingle with those things that are now for the present. We speak it, we decree it, we declare. 
Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If these teachings have been a blessing to you, please leave a note on my Facebook wall. Leave a note in this particular teaching so that others, please forward, forward, share this. Let other people see it, especially those who you know are going through financial difficulty. Tell them this is the solution. You know, this is what you need. All right. And God will make the way for them and you if you decide to do the word of the Lord. You have a blessed rest of the day and a blessed week. And I pray that God will advance you, catapult you, slingshot you as to where you should have been at this point in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen.